Hey guys, Casal here. You're about to watch Thorin talk and talk and talk. But it's kind of good, I swear. This is going to be another episode of Talk to Thorin. And my guest for this one is going to be Config, who you will know I actually have done like a full on reflections interview with about like a, a lot of his career and the online era and stuff. But obviously, by the fact this isn't like reflections part two or whatever, we're not doing like a whole thing of that. What we're going to do is kind of like an update interview because, spoiler, without revealing too much inside baseball industry stuff, like NIP doesn't really like me as an org guy. As a reason, I don't have a lot of their content on my channel. They don't really let players do interviews. So, obviously, at my analogy would be it's sort of like you were on the other side of the cold war for a while you know and i've just been waiting like oh where's config at and then finally you've come back and now we, now we can ask you what's going on and what happened in between so i actually want to go all the way back config because if people remember obviously yeah, the last time we did something was around the time of all the astralis drama and all that stuff where you had the injury etc so what do i actually ask you is this after that, a lot of people were quite shocked by the way that all ended, right? So I actually just want to ask you, listen, in this interview, you know my style, mate. I just ask the questions. You you decide how you answer them. So it's not something like I'm going to force you to answer. You answer how you answer. So what I'll ask is, I want to ask an initial question, actually, which is, now that a few years have gone, and we're not like right in the midst of all that drama and all that stuff, I actually want to ask this question, which is, a lot of people were surprised by like this, the technical way that Astralis uh, got rid of you because it's not that they said right hey we'll sell this guy and if someone wants to buy his contract like you know contact us he's on the transfer market that would be the typical way you'd get rid of a player now or you just bench the player and you know maybe he can come back in the lineup and he's on half a salary or whatever depends what country obviously we're talking about here and that sort of thing or you let his contract run out in your case they simultaneously basically would just like re-release you which just means that the contract's over and like nobody owes anything you could go to another team tomorrow and but they were also, the implication because of what happened was that they were somehow punishing you. So the weird thing I always wanted to know was this. Did, was it like, were they doing you a favor by releasing you so you could just go to another team? Was it like, did by releasing you, did they like save themselves some salary or something? Is there, so, is there some angle that people weren't seeing? It just seemed a bit strange that they just released you out the contract. Like, what, what, did you say, what would you say to that? I mean, I think, of course... I think it was an, a lucky way that it all ended in Astralis. I think it was very like brutal, um, a brutal experience both for them as an organization and also for me as an individual. And yeah, I mean, it was a it was a harsh way of getting rid of me on like the team and of the contract and stuff like that. But I also think like I'm I don't really deserve like a, a, like the treatment um, a better treatment than that. I was like uh, I even agreed to like letting they letting them letting me go and right. telling me to like. Uh, like take my time off and stuff like that, but I of course uh, they terminated my contract and and yeah I got kind of pushed a little bit into it, but it's still like I understand their POV as well. They want to get on with the with their organization and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I mean it it was a it was a harsh uh, a harsh moment of uh, my career, um, but yeah I mean it was hard for Australia as well to to make the decision, but I think uh, in in the end um, I don't have anything against the, the organization at all. By the way, obviously there was actually like a few months during this, after this time period, because you were obviously still injured even in recovering from your injury, where you had to wait to see, would you even find another team? And you got the like standing offers later, a couple of months later towards the end of that year, 2022, if people know what I'm talking about, right? People will remember before that, when you were injured and before Strauss released you, you did put like a big, I think it was like a twit longer or something where you explained all the stuff about how like you were sort of stuck in Malta because you have this injury and you were feeling really low in your life at that point in time, then you, you would go to the RMR. In these months, what was it like? Did that did the cloud sort of go away in these months? And were you able to take a breather because you weren't doing Counter Strike? Was it actually was was like uncertainty about your future making it worse? What would you say? Where was your head at after this time period in late twenty twenty two? Would you say? Um, uh, right after the Melzer incident, the first thing I did was to contact a psychologist. So I went to a psychologist and had the. Uh, a lot of talks with uh, the psychologist trying to get my headspace uh, back and I had trouble sleeping and stuff like that and then we we made some some sessions where I got into like this dream state and kind of okay. like pushed the PTSD out of my system so after uh, a few sessions with the with the psychologist and also like uh, individual work on myself and and also like reflecting over what the fuck I've done, you know, like I fucked up and and all these things so I was really harsh on myself and and also with a uh, with like the operation and the cast on my leg and walking around with this boot and fucking crutches and shit. It was very, uh, it was a very sad period, but I definitely think like going to the, like the psychologist and actually having those hard talks, like developed me into like being a better player and also a better teammate in some sort, even though that it should never have happened. You know, I'm still happy that it became 
as it did, you know, like it kind of ended out in a good situation anyway, because I think it kind of learned me how to be a better version of myself. And I think like sometimes you need like to burn your fingers or like to to fuck up to actually realize that you you made a, a big mistake instead of like always uh, kind of like pushing it away. And I kind of like accepted the yeah my failure and that I'm not a, a perfect guy. I make mistakes and and yeah, I think uh, definitely think the the psychology hours I spent uh, was fucking brutal. I was crying. I was had a lot of emotions going through my body, but I also think like it made me stronger in the end. If people remember, I'm obviously going off memory myself here, but I believe when you got to stand in for Heroic at the Blast World final at the end of the year, it was that Stown, I think it's when he had like a family member die or something, wasn't it? Is this what, am I remembering correctly? Yeah, yeah, it was for the Blast World Finals in Abu Dhabi. I uh, played with them and I was walking around with this big ass cast on my foot and uh, still had like some some metal stuff inside and walking around with that stuff on. It was definitely a, a weird experience, just humping around with my crutches all the, all around in Abu Dhabi. And yeah, I mean, it was a, I actually enjoyed that tournament a lot. I think the, the heroic team I came into was such a core family. It's kind of sad, like thinking about them separating now as, uh, as they are. Yeah, that's actually one thing I did want to ask, which is, when Heroic was at their peak and they were having all that success, everyone knows all the media stuff was like all the Cadian huddles and then they're like literally, literally, sometimes literally people don't know before major like matches, they were like crying with each other and like super emotional and obviously the whole thing was like, wow, they're like friends. Like, what would you say from the outside? Like, is it shocking for even just a brief time you're in the team? Like in the team, I'm assuming they weren't really just like some professional football team, like fuck you, fuck you, whatever, we'll just play and win. Like, I assume some of it was true. Like, they're not actors. So, was it kind of shocking to you like the team you were in here that like, it's only like about a year later, they had completely broken broken up and like apparently then you just break up they had all this like battle internally because civil war or something would you from being in Iraq does that surprise you it it did I was I was shocked by it because the team I went into were so loving and caring and they had all these great talks in between uh, and before matches in between matches and and like it was so easy to be a part of it was just like one big family and then it all just shattered within a couple of months honestly and I think it was it was kind of like a uh, brutal to witness because I've been in the group and then I got taken out of the group and then it just all kind of like fell apart, you know. And I think like if they if they stay together as a team, they would definitely be the top one team in in Denmark right now. So uh, yeah, it was a uh, it's a weird uh, it's a weird thing to see Kadian on Liquid and Stown and Yabi on Australis yes. and the Tesis and Schuss now playing with an international squad in Heroic. Like it's it's a little bit weird, but uh, I mean like everyone is doing decent at the moment. I would say. Was it the case that you, like, obviously this was literally just a stand-in, as I say, for a specific reason. It's not like they were trying you out or anything, but was there actually even a world you thought where if I played well, like, they might pick me up or something? Was that even in your mind at the time? I think the the thing that they told me when I was being a part of the team is that, like, you're, of course, a stand-in, like, Stown is going to return, but we want to help you, like, become a, a good player, or, like, teach you how to, like, play good in our system so you can look good for the outside so maybe someone will get interested in you because I was, of course, like, I was like a hot potato, you know. No one really wanted to have me or sure. like no one had really contacted me. Like the only thing, the only other offer I had was Vitality. They asked me if I could uh, play a stand-in for them uh, because Dupree was taking some time off. And uh, yeah, I mean, they were just kind of like shaping me into their game style and just so I could like look good for the outside and then other people would like take interest in me. So uh, I mean, I, I appreciate that a lot and I think they, they did a great job as well. Oh, are you referring to the one where I think it was Jax they ended up using, right? The old Vitality, the old G2 player. I think that was the total land, right? You could have you could have been that standard potentially too. I think this was around the time of the NIP offer though, right? He took the NIP offer instead, right? Something like that? Yeah, it was uh, it was the exact same time. Like the NIP offer was right. more permanent, permanent offer and then right. the Vitality offer was more of a, a, a stand-in, possibly more, you know, possibly. Sure. Right, when you got this NIP offer, people will know, obviously, the problem NIP has had was long before you got there. It's like they've never managed to get stable five players. Like, the joke is that it feels like every six months that like, a new player comes in or out or someone's, like, temporarily there and then their role switches and so Even when you joined the team, it was kind of like a weird lineup of players, right? When you joined this team, what were your expectations joining NIP? I mean, if people don't know, even though it's a Swedish org, like, the guy who actually run, ran the team at the time was Danish. So did you have, like, the connection there? He was obviously even in North himself previously. Did you have a connection with Calc at all? Do you if people don't know um yeah i mean uh, we, we talked we talked before also when i was at, um, 
uh, in previous teams, we had some talks. I actually enjoy Jonas as a, as, a, as a guy. I think he's a great guy. I think he's funny and he's very Danish as well. I like the sarcasm he's uh, rocking. Uh, but yeah, like the... The NIP offer and the team I joined was, of course, uh, Alexi, Bolan, Riz, Hetrick, and me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it, it was all obvious that there were just so many role clashes. We had no, like, direction we wanted to go. And when I joined the team, I was put in some roles that I didn't really enjoy playing. And, of course, Bolan was playing some roles he didn't enjoy playing. And Riz was playing roles yes. he didn't enjoy playing. So it was just like a, a clusterfuck of, like, good players in the squad. But it didn't really function because no one really were perfect at doing what they were doing, you know? Yes. And every single map, it was very different compared to, let's say, one map, I'm entry. The second map, uh, Bolland is entry. The third map, Res is entry, you know? So it was very, yes. like, very hard to make it consistent in terms of, like, what people were doing, what people were supposed to say when they were uh, communicating to each other and stuff like that. And I think those were, like, the, the big issues we had in the beginning of the team. And, of course, Elixir was trying to put the puzzles together and all those kind of things, but it just didn't really function. Like we, we did decent, but it wasn't really a functioning team, I would say. Yeah, that's something I wanted to ask specifically about what you just referenced there, which is one of the parts that I always thought made people be really harsh to nip is if you just put the roster on paper, some of these players are some of the best rifles Europe's ever had. But the issue, like you say, was you could argue like you, Res and Brawland sort of, it should be the same player. Like you should have the same role in the same spot. So as you actually, what I wanted to ask was exactly what you said there. Like, how do you decide then sort of who gets the spot or who gets played towards in that regard? I mean, you make it sound almost like it was democratic. Like, right, you get a turn, he gets a turn on this map, he has a turn. Is it, was it not like, you know, this person's the best for it and then the other person has to deal with another role? How did it work in that sense? I mean, in the beginning, when I joined the team, the first tournament we went to was Ketsuvich, if I remember right. Yes. Um, the first thing I said when I uh, went into the room with them uh, in the practice room and uh, we were about to like uh, talk about these role situations, I was like, we need to talk about these things because it's so hard for everyone to get on the same level or like get consistently on, on maps if, for example, I need to say some things on a map and then on and another map I'm not even talking at all or it, taking any initiative. And then if you play a B BO3, you... There's one map where you're like silent for half a side and then you have to talk so much on a different map, you know, so it's very hard. And uh, yeah, the decision was basically that everyone needed to have maps where they were active and then other maps you would be less active. So it was like 50%, 50% or like 33%, 33% right. to everyone. Right. So everyone had a little bit of action on, on different maps and also the same with, uh, with the CT sides. It was like... He has star roles. Right. He will get a little bit of star roles. He right. will also have a little bit of star roles. So it was very, uh, very hard in, in the beginning to like figure out like how to make the roster function because we didn't really make the hard decision of saying like you are anchor and yes. this is what you need to do from now on. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a little bit on everyone, and I think that was basically why it was very inconsistent. I want to ask about some of the players, but look, I understand they were recent teammates and obviously it's an interview. I would always be respectful anyway. So I'll ask it in this very careful way. So I actually want to ask about Hedrick, who if people don't know is the Ukrainian AWPA of NIP, right? The problem in his career narrative goes like this. When he was signed initially and people heard he was going to be the AWPA, because like the nature of the signing was like, oh, young up and coming Ukrainian player, like the signing for hundreds of thousands of dollars is going to be an AWPA. Everyone just thought like, oh my God, it's the next Monacy. But what they didn't know unfortunately is he didn't used to be an AWPA. Like Monacy, what, the joke is they were even in the same team if people don't know he was like a rifle in that team and so i've heard in your teams basically when he became an opera like i actually did think i'd saw improvement from him in this team and he, he became sort of pretty decent at the end there but look he obviously wasn't modesty you know, he wasn't like a sensation who took over the world who is this guy because here's what's strange even though people have like flamed things about his game he seems like a like seems like a very innocent guy who's just a very good sort of worker i think it's who is this guy to you I mean, I think Hedrick for me is, uh, of course, we had a really good bond when I was playing with him. I think uh, he he's like a sponge. Like, if you give him some information, he will suck it up, and then he will, like, try to make it work in his way, of course. But I think, like, uh, as we saw, like, when we when we were playing with Alexi, he was, of course, the best version of Hedrick. The same with almost everyone on, on the on the team like uh, when Alexi was controlling it and helping him he was like developing really fast when he fell off or when Alexi got 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 kicked out of the team and we we got a different income leader it was of course harder for him to do it but i think like he he is a really good player he is a really like fast individual player like he's a young kid he has like the snap reactions uh, the the sad part is just like if he's not happy within a team or if he's not enjoying playing in a team he like 
kind of loses it a, it a little sure. bit, like loses the motivation a little bit, and then then he will gradually get worse and worse. But I think he still has the motivation to like become a really really strong individual player because I've seen him in practices, I've seen him like dominate the uh, matches and stuff. But <coughs> when you're a new player like that and you're so young and talented, there's also a lot of pressure on you, and also think like playing him. Having him in NIP with so many roster changes, so many different IGLs and stuff, it of course makes it harder for a new talent to develop because you get you heard things from Alexi, for example, saying you have to do this, you have to do this, this is good for the team. Then uh, Hampus comes in, oh, you have to do this for the team, this is this is way better. And then Alex comes and says, you have to do this. You sure. know, like what, what <laughs> the kid doesn't understand what the fuck's happening around sure. him, you know? So like I think he 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 learned a lot, but I also think like he got a little bit confused in all these roster changes that we've had in the team. And I think it's very sad that seeing people bashing on him as an individual player because I think if he was on Monte, for example, and he played on Monte, I think he would be a way better individual than right. what he was on NIP. Right. What about um obviously another one who now isn't in NIP is Brawler. Now the funny thing is People kept doing this thing where they obsessed about the idea that he, the reason he left Fnatic was that he didn't want to speak English or something stupid. Whereas, like, the joke of that was, if people have never, like, seen that, that's an example of where, like, first of all, he didn't say that. I will say that. I think that was, like, Khan or someone from Fnatic said that. And then secondly, if you know guys how to, like, read between the lines, like, the joke of that was, when he said, like, he didn't want to speak English, he just meant he didn't want to play with Smooya. Like that, that, and that. Listen, and the point is, there's a difference between don't want to talk to anyone in English or don't want to talk in English to smooth you. Like that was the sense I got, and some of the things I don't from the So I think people overblew that. But as a result, when he added problems in an IP at times, I think people often blamed that they kept saying it's because it's not an all Swedish team. He should go back to you know everyone always puts his name in those lists with Norcliffe. You got to make the all Swedish team. So the question I have for you is this: Obviously, people have seen since he's left and he's gone to Mouse. It looks like he's kind of like brought his career back, and he's looking like he's almost back to his best. Did he seem like someone who again I? from role or personality temperament was he having a hard time in NIP was something not vibing for him do you think what would you say as a teammate I think when when I joined the team it was very hard for Luda to actually play his game or to actually like do as he wanted because there were so many different opinions and I think he fits way better in in, in mouse than he did in NIP and and of course also the role situations like he wanted to play a certain style and Alexi wanted a certain style and I wanted a certain style and the DJL wanted a certain style. So I just like all the mix-ups, I think he kind of got lost in like how he wanted to do. And I think his confidence level like kind of shut down. So he wasn't like hitting the, sh hitting the shots that he think he should hit. And he was like blaming himself, being mad on teammates, being mad on the situation. Like it was, it was like a bad mix of vibes and it was just sad to see him like go down in NIP like that because I knew when he when he got to a mouse or if he got to like a different team that he would shine because he's such a strong individual player. Like I felt him, uh, I, I seen him dominate in practices. I've seen him dominate in, in official games as well, but like he wasn't, I don't, he wasn't happy in an IP. Like I, that's, that I'm for sure about that. Like I could see it on him and you can also see it on, on mouse now that he, when he is, when he's playing the games with mouse guys and, and also the, the content that they're doing, that he's actually enjoying the people that's around him. And I think like that's a, uh, that's something that he he should always have as a, as a player. I think he's very emotional. Into like he plays better when he's when he's of course happy. I think everyone does, but I think it's it matters more for for um, for Bolan. One thing I want to ask about Rez is because I feel like a lot of the audience that isn't Swedish don't know this guy. The joke is they just keep referencing when he was the old NIP, whatever it is, I am San Jose Rez, or that famous line that everyone always says. Like, but I get the sense they don't know him that well because he's quite a quiet guy, doesn't do loads of interviews. Right. The thing I would ask is this it seems like, even though like people might think because of that nostalgia, he's supposed to be like the star player or he's super sick him and stuff. If I got always got the vibe from the outside, like it seems like he's a guy who just does whatever he's asked to do in the team. Like I noticed in NIP before head trick, I think he was the AWP. He's done all. It looks like he just fits the squad. Who is this guy? What, what's it like to play with this player? Because it seems like he always stays in an IP, so people must like him. So, what, what, what's he got going for him? What's he, what's he good at? Yeah, he's Neo from the Matrix. He's touching all the bullets <laughs> sure, in the NIP. True. No, uh, but I mean, yeah, I, I actually enjoyed playing a lot with uh, with Res uh, Fredan. I think he he's a strong individual player. I think he uh, he fits a certain role. I think maybe not the map control role. I I, I don't think he he fits fits it that well. I think he's more of a thinking about like um he's more of a passive player than a risk taker and i think right. like uh, it's kind of it kind of favors risk takers at the moment doing the map control and and also like 
uh, gaining the space for them in the, in the map control. But yeah, I think I really enjoyed playing with him. I think he's a smart player. I think he's a, a strong individual. He's an emotional player as well. But yeah, as you were saying, he's he's a quiet person, uh, but also has a lot of opinions. Uh, but he he's sharing them. Uh, not that often, you know. So when he actually shares his opinion, he's a little bit triggered. Like that, that, that's right, how it okay, usually goes I'll down. Say. So um, no, but actually, I enjoyed playing with him. I think he will be. Uh, I think he will be doing pretty well in in the NIP. Uh, I was about to say jail, which is not, but uh, but in the NIP squad, uh, I think he's been there for I don't know seven years now. I think he is uh, almost have. He's been there like almost as long as Forrest was there. Uh, That's crazy to think about. So, it doesn't, seem, like, it doesn't seem like it could be right, could it? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think I think he's the he's right after Forrest. Makes in, in sense. Terms of, yeah, he's there a long but time. I mean, yeah, I think uh, I think he will he'll do great. I actually enjoyed playing with him. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just unlucky turn of events with all the roster changes and shit like that. So I don't think we actually got to see. Uh, the potential of 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 uh, the I am Oakland twenty twenty seventeen uh, MVP. Right, when you qualified to make it to the Blast Paris Major, what was this like a significant moment for you in light of the fact the consequences of like the Australia stuff was you obviously didn't get to go to the RMI, you didn't get to go to the Rio Major. Was it a big deal to be back at the major? It was an unreal tournament, honestly. I think. For me as an individual, I've never experienced such intense games in the RMR. We, uh, of course, beat Astralis uh, and we also beat Enns. And we were actually starting to feel like um, a proper team. Like uh, we were like, a, a, the band is back together, you know, like we were actually functioning. Uh, we were having good communication and those kind of things. So I was really enjoying like the whole um, part of 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 the NIP lineup, the NIP squad, and the qualifying part was insane. Like I I missed playing the majors. Like you know that it's always different going to a major. It's always different playing the RMRs. There's always more stakes. It's 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 an insane feeling as an individual player uh, when you when you feel like you kind of deserve it as well uh, that you actually make it work. So uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. Not the previous one, but uh, the the Paris major one. Right, in the actual major itself, in the first Swiss system, the like challenger stage, what they call it now, which didn't used to be the old major, but everyone remembers, that's the first start. You guys actually seemed like you had a fairly easy run. It was already Ents, who was one of the best teams in the world that beat you. Like I said, like, you sort of just, just went through, right? Was was this giving you like confidence? Like, I mean, I'm guessing everyone boot camp like fuck for this because it was the last ever CS goal major, right? Was, was it seeming in the first phase like things were going well? Definitely. I think we we worked hard. Uh, we, we spent the hours talking about the right things that we need to talk about. We had boot camps where, without PCs, so everyone was on the same page. We were functioning in some sort of like the chaos that we were brought into. We were functioning in the chaos and trying to make the best out of the worst situation with all the positions we were playing that were off and all those kind of things. But yeah, it was a, it was a, an enjoyable tournament, of course. Lost to Apex, I think, in the... No, we definitely yes. did. I don't, we, we lost to Apex in the last game there and... Uh, we should definitely have ended on a third map up, but uh, yeah, um, it was a brutal match to lose. But I think we we learned a lot as as individuals as well from uh, from from those games. Right, look, I'm gonna ask this in a way that sounds like I'm just setting you up to complain, but you don't. It's up to you how you answer it. All I'll say is this: in that second Swiss stage, the one that you lost at the end by losing to Apex. Like, look, even though now we know Apex went to the semi final of the major, so now people will say they're good, and obviously a bunch of their players got picked apart and went to other squads. At the time, everyone was like, "Lol, who's Apex?" So obviously, the last result is a bad one. But before that, mate, I don't know if you guys could have gotten a worse draw. You went from Fnatic into Fury into Navi into Ents, and then Apex last. Like, that's pretty. That's like almost as hard as it. Can can get in a Swiss system. What do you do if you get a draw like that? Do you, are you one of these people where, like, whatever, you know, it happened? Do, do you feel a bit bitter? Like, obviously, you know, if you get, like, one or two easier wins, maybe you just get through anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you still have to win all, against all the teams, right, at, uh, at the biggest tournament. So you always want to fun- uh, focus on one one game at the time. But, yeah, it was definitely a rough a rough run. But I think uh, for as an individual, only talking, like, um, how I thought about it was, like, if you, if you don't beat them, you don't deserve to be there anyway. So... The as far as we got to the last game, the qualifying game, the two-two game, it was like we didn't deserve it in the end. And Epics wanted it more; they deserved it more, and they they put in the hours more than we did, or like functioned together as a team more than we did. So, of course, it was a heartbreaking result, losing. But I mean, it is what it is. I I, I gave props to them. I think they they 
that they were playing so good together as a team and they were taking all the chances that we didn't take so they had the bigger uh, the bigger ball sack than uh, than we did so they definitely deserved it I would explain it like this, even though, as you say, obviously there was a lot of ups and downs and Nip didn't have a lot of deep finishes. This was looking at this point before this Apex match, like the best this NIP squad ever looked, like you say. The team was getting better. You went through the RMR. You kept, you get through the first Swiss system. You didn't go to the 2-2 game. You get to this one, even though you get this insane run, by the way. Like I said, those four names. You won two of the games, including, by the way, before this Apex one. You guys beat Entz 2-0 when Entz was like legitimately. I remember, guys, after this, they went and like won a fucking tournament. Like they're actually like one of the top teams in the world. So coming into the Apex game, like I said, actually most people thought Nip's going to win this game. They're going to be a playoff team. And also, I can totally understand why everyone looked so disappointed at the end. Because if no one remembers these games, if you're a fan who didn't watch this match, I'll give you the quick update. Basically, NIP had a massive lead on both first halves and then just had like, not even just where you lose, but it's like you're right on almost like the round. You just need to win one more. You just keep losing the one, the one, the one. And then, you know, you keep telling yourself we'll get there eventually. And then you just at the end, both maps just end like the most uns. Like the funny thing is, if I'm Apex, probably the greatest match of all time I bet they were fucking riding an insane high coming back I think one of them even told me like Steeco because he's so legit I think he even told me he thought the match was over mate that they were going to lose at some point so like it is kind of like the most heartbreaking way to lose right and not make the major playoffs give me some thoughts on this match oh my god I don't even want to think back but yeah <laughs> I, I honestly I think it, it, it haunts me a little bit uh, yeah it was uh, it was tough I remember we were we were grinding we were getting all the rounds we were uh, kind of dominating them and then we switched to, I think it was T-side. And then they just started grinding the rounds back and we started being more and more passive. And we we were like, not taking the risk. People started talking less, less, less as individuals. And Alexi was just straight up calling, like he was just calling left and right. And no one was really like 100% in on the calls as well. You know, like right. people were a little bit like, ah, maybe this is not a good idea, but we'll do it anyway. And it, it, it felt like it was just, it just felt like the the soul got sucked out of your body, kind of, you know, like you were just losing, losing. You got you drifted further, further away, and you were thinking about, oh my god, what if we lose this match? And yeah, in in the end, we did. And I think it it was a collective loss for sure. And I was also a little bit harsh on Alexi after the... Let me like ask you about this. HNTV. Let me ask you, because I actually think people... Have, you know, I purposely saved it till now. People will probably be quite surprised, Config, earlier that you've brought up Alexi a bunch of times. You've been very complimentary. You've even said things like everyone played their best when he was the IGL. But obviously, famously, after this, when you did your interview, you did say... It was the headline, to be fair. People don't read beyond the headline. But the headline was, like, we stuck to the playbook too much. And then people read that as, like... So uh, they sound like you're blaming XCB. That's what they thought, at least. So being as he then left the team after this, what's your take on that? Like, what did you mean by that? And what's your take on Lexi B? Um, what what happened was, like, after the game, of course, it's hard to do, like, an interview. And it kind of, like, flew out flew out of my mouth as well. But the thing is that we used the strat book in a certain way that we also would have used it in a practice, for example. Or, like, we just trusted the strat book a little bit too much and didn't, like, go out of the strat book because they, they, it felt like they were just having us under control. We didn't have any answers to do, but we just kept doing the same things and we got dominated all the time. And we, were, we weren't really trying to, like, free call it or, like, taking chances somewhere or doing something unorthodox to, like, at least get around to get the ball rolling. And it wasn't, like, a hit at Alexi. And I also talked with right. Alexi about this. It was more of, like... The entire team didn't really come up with ideas, so we had we were forced to right. use the, the piece of paper that was laying on the fucking table, which is probably not the best idea because sure. we felt red all the time. They were always taking info, always like knowing where we were, and we were just running like head first into a brick wall. And for Alexi as an as an in-game leader and as a as a as a friend as well, I think he is an individually strong in-game leader. Like in, he's a straight-up leader. He he does whatever it takes to to make the team function, and he also like bites the sour apple sometimes, as you see in G2, as you see in NIP, and you will. I hope you won't see it in in Navi because I think he's doing a f amazing job in Navi, like as a as a leader as well. So um, he's a he's a stand-up guy. I, I respect him a lot, and I always talk to him at tournaments. And I uh, I don't think there's any bad blood in between us, but there maybe is some misunderstandings in, in the community, sure. but, uh, but for sure, like I, I didn't mean it as a, 
fuck this guy. Like he fucked me. Okay. He, he took away my chances. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing like that. Okay. Along those lines though, what I would ask is this, is people are obviously going to think because he left the team after this and they only saw that headline. I'm assuming like people who just plebs and they didn't like look into it again or they don't, maybe they can't, they only remember that because it was such a drama bomb, right? They're going to think because it was implied after, like a lot of people, but I thought after this, oh great, maybe they go back and they just like rebuild things. They bring another player. I never thought they were going to kick Lexi B. Like what? So the implication was that it's cause when Hampus comes back, like he was going to be the IGL or whatever, right? So what would you say on that angle? Like you don't have to say if it was you, but was the inside the team, were their players who were like in favor of Alexi B leaving was this an org decision? What would you say? Um, it was he definitely got pushed out uh, of like both both the, some of the players and and some of the some of the staff uh, and yeah it was a it was a sad sad thing when he uh, when he got kicked. I remember him. Uh, I remember we got a we got a text message saying that uh, he's leaving the team when we were on break. Um, and the first thing I did was I called Alexi and I told him like, and I said something like, we're going to post this in like a month or something like that about him uh, getting kicked out of the team. And and I was like, that's not nice for Alexi. It's in the player break. Like people are making changes now. You should get this out as fast as possible. So I called him up and I told him like, I think you should tell NIP to like release it instantly. And so you can maybe get some offers from from some teams. And and, and he did that. And uh, he went to Navi. So, I mean, not that I'm saying that I, I got him the spot in sure. Navi, but uh, but I think like it, it was a it was a good choice. But yeah, I mean, he, he got pushed out. And I think I wasn't agreeing fully with the choice. I think I, I, I trusted some of the some of the players in the teams. I'm not gonna name any names, but yeah, I leaned a little bit too much and then on them uh, with all the stuff that they told me uh, about Hampus. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it was a, it was one of the worst decisions I've ever been a part of making in uh, in my entire career. I, on the Hampus one, I also have a, a, a way to set this up, which goes like this. If I just actually watch him, like I remember particularly when Device joined the team, obviously then everyone was watching an IP. Like this guy was one of the players that looked the best. He looked really good at the time. Like individually, he sort of mastered that lurk style and he had really good timings. But then obviously the strange thing was at that point in time, even though he was the in-game leader of that Device team, he used to, at least I'm, I'm almost certain I remember this correctly. He can say if otherwise, if, if, if he disagrees. But I'm almost certain he said in interviews that like he didn't really want to be an in-game leader or like he only sort of did it because he didn't have an in-game leader or something. So what's weird is I heard in this scenario, this is essentially I've heard but much of times back and forth, like, does he want to be an IGL? Does he not want to be an IGL? Does he want to just be a lurker? Does he want to be a lurker and an IGL? For, who is the Hampus you role? Like, does, does he seem like he wants to be an IGL? Is he suited to this role? What is he like as a player and a teammate? Um, I think I got a, I think I got a bad side of Hampus. I think I got a Hampus that really didn't enjoy playing uh, at all. I think it was like a bad time for him to join the team as well. I think that was also why he got this short stint of like being a part of the team, because it just was like it kind of got into like a group of Swedes against me and Hetrick, and you know like we got. All right. It was like it was wasn't really working in like the terms of people and in terms of like the groups that were being built like they wanted a swedish team blah, 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 all this stuff you know like so we were kind of thinking we are going to get pushed out and then the organization made a decision on 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 hampus but i think he is a really strong player i think he is a good in game leader like we've seen him success with nip before he's been at the quarterfinals at majors he's yes. been doing great at tournaments and and he's also a strong individual in-game leader which is also very rare to find as you see like uh, some some of the other in-game leaders are not that strong individually they can't really like win games on their own but Hampus could and uh, yeah I think it was just a unlucky timing to get Hampus in as an in-game leader because it didn't it didn't really work like it it, it just didn't didn't work with the, the the personalities in the team was it the case that um like one thing I want to know is when you had this squad and Alexi B went out. Obviously, the, the weird thing is, this is why that year last year was so messy for me because everyone already knew around this time that whole thing of like, CS2 is coming, but at the same time, there's a player break. And then if you remember, the, I know a lot of players actually thought that like the first time after the player break will be CS2. Like we didn't know it would take extra time. There'd be Cologne and all that. So I, I got the vibe personally. That's actually why if you go and look, I think a lot of teams' results are up and down and people are making weird roster moves or just not making roster moves. It's like no one was sure. No one was sure. Like basically, do we keep playing CS2? Go? Is CS2 coming out? Is it going to be different? Are the lineups still like where was your head at in this time period? Because this is right when these roster moves up in like Alexi and Tampers, and so then we have to make another like where, where was your head at last year? 
I mean, I, I was a little bit scared, to be honest, because, like, yeah, as you said, we had no clue what was happening with, like, are we going to play CSGO? Are we going to play CS2? Um, what tournaments are going to switch? Are we going to play CSGO and then a CS2 tournament and then a CSGO tournament? Like, what's happening? But I think NIP made a good decision by telling us, like, you need to start playing CS2. Like, you, you start as soon as you right, can. You guys start before, game, so you just, the, you start before yeah. the last tournament then. Yeah, yeah, right. we started we started earlier than everyone else playing ah. the game and practicing and we we built the stra the the prep groups uh, invited teams and all those kind of things so we could start earlier because we didn't have any tournaments uh I think we didn't have any tournaments coming up like uh, very close to the time after the after the break. So yeah, we started early. Um it was a weird time. Like no one knew what was up, what was down. Like, uh, are we going to play this in two years? Are we? Are we way too early? Are we? Uh, are we ahead of time? And yeah, I mean, it was a uh, it was a choice by NIP, and I think honestly, it was a very good choice. I think it was threat saying that we should start practicing like earlier than rather earlier than later. Right. One thing I do want to ask is, what was the role of the impact of? Threat and DGL, because obviously these are two people who, I mean, Threat's been in and out of the team, but DGL's been there for a few years. If people don't know, DGL is actually the guy where, he was actually in that, like, contact team before or whatever. He was in, like, a team with, like, a bunch of, like, because I because I believe he's, isn't it something weird? Like, he has, like, dual nationality. Like, he's a simultaneous, like, Swedish, like, Balkan or something weird like that. Something like that, right? So he has, like, a connection of both scenes or whatever. And then, obviously, people will know Threat mainly as, like, the mastermind from 1.6 and early coaching CS goals. So who were these two people? What were they kind of doing in the team? Like, were they in charge of the whole project and they get to decide like roster moves what's what's their what's their role um yeah so djl was of course the head coach he was uh, he was the one that um, made the decisions like had the last call of course um so the nip management gave him the power to like do whatever he wanted to do and like to put people in the roles that they should be in and those kind of things and then of course threat was like watching over his shoulder like kind of making decisions behind the scenes and like having a lot of meetings and stuff. But I, I think that it was a good addition to get Threat in to be like the the management guy, like the GM for, for, for the CS division because um, the NIP office didn't have like a really, really good like understanding of like the roles and all those kind of things and like how to um, build a CS team. So I think he got kind of like pushed into like creating uh, a CSGO team or like a CS2 team. So I think that's what he's doing now. And and yeah, DJ was just a just a coach, like a head coach. He wasn't really um, doing anything special, I would say. Like he was, uh, of course, a stand-up guy, uh, also a good understanding of the game, and 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 had good relationship with um, had a good relationship with Alex, um, and of course Hampus as well. Yeah, what was that? That that team, by the way, of all the moves they've done, it's a bit weird that first of all they like break a Swedish team as a Danish player, then you get like a Ukrainian player. Well, our Spanish IGL gets to the team. I don't know, but fair enough. What was it like? Because everyone knows, like, Movistar Riders was an interesting team. What was it like to work with Alex? Who's this guy? He's a grinder, definitely. I think he he grinds his way to the top. I think um, it was a great experience. It's, of course, a little bit harder when you have a Spanish-English-speaking in-game leader because they have a little bit of an accent compared to, for example, let's say you have a Danish-English-speaking in in-game leader or English-speaking in-game leader. Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a decent experience. I think uh, I enjoyed uh, working with Alex. I think he he teached me some things or showed me some things that I need to develop on, and I shared some of my uh, things that I've learned from past teams. He's a really open and honest guy, like open-minded and. And yeah, I mean, I, I think he's a great guy. I think he's a good in-game leader, but of course he still has to prove himself in an international team. Like you can't really take a Spanish guy, put him in an international team and be like, now you call and now you make yes. this work. I think he has to like uh, get into the international things and like um, understand like how the team wants to play because also think Spanish CS has a certain style of playing. And I think he has to like get used to the international style of 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 making it work as well you know like with different players and now he gets the opportunity to actually build a team around him and Riz. so we will see how how he will manage to to like develop into an in-game leader an international in-game leader for me he's still a little bit of a spanish in-game leader but yeah I, I'll, i'm excited to see what the future brings for for alex as well was there any kind of like a hint or even like of rumbling that if the NIP doesn't qualify to this major now through the RMR, like you or others might be kicked? Was there like, was there a sense of like, that has to work out if we, and also if you qualified, do you think the team would still be together? <laughs> I mean, tough question, obviously. Yeah. I mean, like I was pretty, I was pretty certain that if we bummed out, 
oh, if we just didn't qualify, we we would get uh, dissolved as a team, like we would get disbanded. Um, but I was also not certain about like if we let's say we qualified through the to the major and we we let's say we bombed out in groups in the major. I still think we would get uh, get disbanded. I think NIP had the uh, they had a vision. They had like a, a road they wanted to go, and this was just like we just give it one more shot. You know, like you you're at the major. This is the you're at the RMR. This is what you need to do, and and we will make changes on on how we feel. But I still think that they. The video that they made, of course, put a lot of pressure on us as individual players. Uh, the announcement that they made that they want to do superstar signings, so and and the the video about like um, them talking to different players and trying to make roster changes even before we got to the armor uh, was a little bit of uh, like someone like tied you up and <laughs> just put you in the chair and be like perform. Uh, I think everyone was a little bit stunned over the video, but I think it's just the way it is in in NIP sometimes. Like uh, unlucky that it was that time, but I think they they did it because they they felt like they had to do it. I don't. I don't oh know. right, I see. You do you you actually do interpret it that it wasn't just like you know sort of like let's just say not a great tone. It was more like they were trying to make it sort of like to put pressure on you guys to perform. Like you have to, essentially, if you don't do well, we're going to change the team. Was almost, they were almost setting that to you guys. It was almost a message to you, you think? I mean, I, mean, I, tr- I, I, I tried to use it as like fuel, you know, like uh, right. instead of taking it like, oh, fuck, they're going to get, I don't know, Yekida instead of me sure. or something like that, you know? <laughs> I, I wanted to use it like, I'm just going to fucking try my best here and whatever happens, happens, you know? And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, we've tried so many different roster changes now in in the team, and 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 I understood their their decision, uh, of course, by 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 benching some other players and and trying to build something on on uh, like from from scratch. Uh, but yeah, I I used it as like fuel to to just get it fucking done. Like just try to f- do this RMRs, do do it as good as you can, and 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 not think as it as like. Oh, if I if I don't kill twenty uh, this game, I'm kicked. You know, like because I think that would sure. have been way worse. One of the things about the way the RMR went is, look, if people see the name and IP, they still have big expectations. And if they see they don't make it, they go 0-3. It just sounds like, right, they were total shit. Like, who gives a fuck? But if people go and look, I would just say this, right? First of all, every team that beat you, everyone's actually big it up right now. All of them. Everyone actually tells me, by the way, Eternal Fire is supposed to be really good. Like, that was in super close. Not just 13-11, if people don't know. The Ancal one is the old Entropic guys. And everyone also is loving that they're going to be like at the, at the major. That was a fucking like mega raw T games. So the first two losses out of the three lives are like, could be wins of a nip. And then, yeah, the third one, which I will say everyone did celebrate saw making it. That one was, a, they did smash you on those ones. But like the first two lives, basically, like these could be even be wins. So even though I know the story will be written as, ah, who gives a shit, nip was trash anyway. The first two games seemed like actually this is the chance to make it to the major maybe. Yeah, definitely. It felt it felt it felt really good, honestly. When we were playing, uh, uh, we tried to do the things we've we've done in practice. We tried to just like focus on ourselves. Uh, don't think too much about the the opponents uh, because you know everyone brings new shit to the RMRs. Like if you have too too much anti strat, maybe you can mind fuck yourself in some sort. Uh, of course, you need to have tells and stuff like that. But yeah, I, like the CT sites, the CT sites that we played were pretty fucking good like uh, overall on the two BO1s uh, of course the saw game you can question that right but uh, but the two the two games we played versus uh, Eternal Fire and Amkal were like pretty good games the the T sides not that much uh, the Eternal Fire game I think we actually if we won that game I don't want to like say oh we're going to sure. we would win the major sure. you know but like I think if we won that game we would have a like a a way better like role because I, NIP have been always like this ever since I've been here if we have a bad start to like a tournament or if we have a bad start in a game it's always harder for us to like keep the ball rolling but if we like smash the first opponent then the next game will be easier and if we smash them then the, th- the third game will be easier uh, so yeah I, I I mean if we if we just fucking won that eternal fire game I, it would have been way different but yeah we were struggling individually as well I think uh, we were uncomfortable as, as individuals and the CT sites were functioning on all pass. And yeah, we just got smashed by Saw. I think they, they fully destroyed us. Right. What would you say? Uh, obviously, people are going to... 
Right, the problem you have in your career right now goes like this, mate, which is the joke is right now everyone's critiquing from Cloud9, the player Axile, right? They're all going like, what the hell? Where's his numbers? Like, he's supposed to do like a 1.2 rating. And it's like, bro, like he's not donk. Like, you know, like almost no one with a rifle is going to do that like every tournament. Like, look, I agree. He probably has had a drop off and he used to be really insane. But like, I also think people don't get realized like if you're an aggressive player with a rifle, it's really hard to put massive like stats numbers, right? To me, isn't that role more about about, like, literally the kills in the space you create on the map, right? Sort of, like, the joke there, I would say, is, like, when they used to have Shiro, my joke would have been some of, like, Axile's impact's going to come if Shiro wins, right? If he cleans up and gets, like, a 3k, that was probably something to do with Axile. What would you say to this aspect? Because I feel like the problem in the modern day with stats is people are acting like, like, the, the analogy here would be config. It would be like if I looked at some winger in football and I was like, he hasn't scored 20 like the striker. It's like, he was a fucking winger, though. Like, like the striker's job's to score the goals. The winger passes the ball or scores the odd goal. What would you say in this sense? Do you think people are harsh on you? Because I know in your case particularly, they always just go, like, they almost treat you like you're now like it's not north 2017 anymore mate it's like yeah the game's <laughs> totally different though that was a million years ago at this point guys like the game was really wide open then what would you say about like uh, being a rifle in the modern day what would you say about the roles in that sense i think my role has gotten way harder compared to csgo because of the shortage of rounds as well and the economy has changed oh, right. like a lot so if you like lose the first weapon round you're like fuck if i do something aggressive next round or like in next buy round it's over like uh, i need to take care of like making the right decisions and stuff but yeah as well the stats wise as in like hard entry or someone that takes the chances in map control for your team is always looking way worse than the team uh, the teammate that's behind you of course or someone that is let's say baiting a little bit yeah. or someone that is like telling you to like jump this corner for me and I'll, I'll kill two guys, you know, and then you look like shit on the stats. But I also think like if you watch games and have an understanding of Counter-Strike and like you actually like a, a, a hard fan of Counter-Strike and you like rewatch some matches, you would also see like this guy is like actually making space for his teammates to actually perform uh, in these scenarios. And then Sometimes you bite the sour apple and then other games you actually like always predict what your opponent is doing and you just fucking destroy them, right? And you just f always feel like you're in this flow state and you can do whatever you want and your teammate is always at the right position to reflect you if something happens so you don't feel bad of like dying in a stupid scenario. And yeah, I think it's really, uh, really overlooked on how like hard the entry role is compared to like the trader role or the map control player's role compared to like the second map control or the, the, the lurker role because the lurker role isn't taking really any changes he'll just save for next buy round or then he'll kill two uh, in like a in a, like an easy way compared to like the entry guy that is like risking whatever it is to to like make space for his teammates one thing I wanted to ask specifically about how you played in an IP goes like this. I remember a few years back when you were in that Optic team, which is actually the thing that sparked me to write that article, is even back then I actually was already friendly with Snappy, who was the in-game leader I talked to quite a lot. And obviously, I knew MSL as well. And so I remember when I talked to Snappy, I actually did like publicly and proudly frame him a bit. I was just like, what the hell? Like, why are you using config like this? Like, it's just a waste of his skills, man. Like, you just make him run first around the corner, he gets shot. And then, like, you wonder why I won't say the names of the other players. But some of them aren't going to fucking get the 3K, are they? Like, and I, so Here's what he told me, though. He told me, though, yeah, but you're saying that like I'm doing that. He said in our team, he doesn't ask to do that. He's totally fine being the first. And I got the sense when I talked to you in my interview afterwards, you even said, because your, like, actual confidence was, like, low at the time or whatever, and you didn't see yourself the same way as a player. You knew you weren't putting in the time, for example. You actually almost felt like, you know, it'd almost be rude to say, like, essentially, the, the joke would be, it'd be like if you were a footballer, you never came to training, then you came to the match. Like, hey, coach, like, set it all up for me, though. Like, give me all this. Like, that would be kind of BM, right? Everyone would be like, what the fuck? We're all was there anything like that in an IP? I mean, obviously you came in on kind of a bit of a back foot because of the Astralis thing. C could you have come in and been like, look, build everything around me, make me look my best? Did, we, did you take a little bit of a back seat at times, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think uh, when I came in, I was like more leaned back in the beginning. I was like, a, I trusted Bolan and Riss to be like the star players. Like that was what we talked about as a team that they will be the star players. They have the, the role of like the map control roles and they have the, the, the CT roles where they, they should perform. And I trusted trusted the, the decisions being made, uh, of course, in the team and younger players. Um, Bolan is a young guy, a lot of potential. Uh, Riss is like the guy that has done everything, but he has never been like a star player uh, in, a, in a team. He haven't had all the star roles. So I was like, I don't deserve this shit, you know, like you can take it. But as time went on, I was like starting to get more like, please, I need to try to at least get into the situations I got into in my previous teams. I think I could do really good in these roles, but it just really never 
got to that point where I was like in the in the confident roles of of like how I wanted to play or what I wanted to do. I was, I think, a little bit too lean back in terms of like not taking the initiative of saying like this is what I want to do. I think you guys should help me doing this or also getting the help from from teammates. I think they were having a little bit of a different vision of how map control is supposed to be taken compared to how I would take it. So it was uh, it was it was different opinions and and I was like in the end you guys just do you guys and I'll just try to do do my part. What is your sense? How would you explain where Config is in his career? Like as an individual player, like, what do you think of your like skill set? Where do you see yourself? Do you like uh, like in the next team are you supposed to be a star player? Are you going to return? What, what's your what's your vision of who Config is right now? I think con- the config is the one that I'm I'm missing a little bit is the one that haven't been in NIP. I think in Astralis I actually showed some really good games. I actually showed some really good rounds where I'm take- making the right decisions because I'm used to being in these scenarios. And like the the the, the game I want to play is of course map control on T side and on CT side I would w- I would want to be like the rotation guy running around in between bomb sites because I think I can be like the unpredictable guy that's in the position where what you the fuck he's, he's you don't like to free. just sit in the site right you like to push and flank and stuff like that right yeah I like to be unpredictable in 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 that sense and and of course I need space to do it but it's not like I'll just do it every single round I'll do some random shit you know I want to play within structure of course in in both of the sites CT and T side. But yeah, I enjoy like taking map control uh, with teammates. I enjoy taking map control, taking the risks in map control as well. Like you don't need to flash all the angles for me to, for me to like be. Ah, this is nice and safe for me, and now I get the map control, you know. And then there's uh, 30 seconds left, and we have to rush aside. I would I would like sacrifice myself in terms of like getting the space for for my teammates, of course. But I would also like to like get set up a little bit with some nice plays by teammates. Maybe they have ideas for me, and I would bring ideas for them, you know. Like having a cohesion in a team around like building building map control within a team is like talking as individual players with each other and like offering stuff basically and i think like having a team that offers stuff for you and like shows you things that they think is good is very um underrated like i think you learn way more as a team doing that stuff but yeah i think the map control wise playing uh, unpredictable stuff uh not really running through smokes or jumping through smokes and all that kind of stuff anymore. I think that's kind of like outdated uh, a little bit now. Now you need to have like great team play around the map control guy for it to actually look good and function. Uh, I think if you take too many risks, you will put your teammates in a worse scenario than if, for example, you get set up to do it, right? Because there's so there's way less gun rounds now than there was previously. But yeah, like CT side rotations, definitely a, a banger for me. I think like I'm pretty good at those rotation rounds. So I think my overpass CT is is pretty strong because I I feel the game. I'm just roaming around doing whatever my teammates need me to do, and 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 T side as well. I think uh, the map control. I, I need to get used to it now because I've been a little bit out of it, but I want to get back into it again because I still think like not that I I can be like a dunk, you know. I'm. I'm an old dog, you know, I'm not uh, 17 years old, you know, he has 10 years on me. But I, st- I still think, like, I could be, uh, I can definitely be uh, within the top 20 still. I, I'm not done. Like, I still have the motivation to play the game. I still have motivation to to build a team, like, from scratch, even. Like, I'm I'm, I'm here to, to dominate again. I think my showing in NIP has been, I mean, I'm even sad just looking at the numbers, you know. But I also know that it's not me. And I think the, the ones that know me from previous teams is also saying that it's not uh, it's not config even though you say that obviously jokingly compared to donk you are old like you are still only 26 years old i hope people know that like the problem they don't realize is you were a, a young player when you first came in at sk and north and all those squads so if people don't realize like you're not that old now like there's there's plenty of big names like essentially if you look at the big stars you could still have like three really big years for all we know like do you have that sense also there's still time left i think I've reflected a lot about this, especially also after my time in Astralis when I was um, uh, down with the with the leg with the leg issue and 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 talking with the psychologist and stuff. I I reflected on. She, uh, I remember she asking me, Christian, when when do you want to stop playing? Because I told her about like the lifestyle and how long times and traveling and how many hours we spend in front of a screen, and like the feeling I got like in. And the, the the thoughts I got was like when my motivation is done, you know, like and when the motivation is done, I think you you should stop playing because that's when that's when you will just play for money. And I'm not here to fucking just get a 
paycheck and be like, ah, fuck it, I'm out, you know, and then go invest in something and live my life. I'm I'm still here for for the for the fans, for the streams, for 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 the good place. So uh, yeah, the motivation is uh, is the biggest part for me. And I, of course, I still have good years in me. Like I'm I'm 100 sure that I could still play on the stage in Cologne, play on the stage in Katowice, play on the stage in the major and and, and do good. Like uh, I'm not saying that I'm gonna be and Nico uh, tomorrow, but um, I'm definitely still up for the grind. I'll, I'll put in the hours for it, definitely. And what is your general sense on CS2? Because, I mean, some would argue, actually, aggressive riflers, some of them are sort of thriving in this game. I mean, the joke is it's kind of the opposite of all complete at the moment. So what have you thought of CS2? I honestly think it's a pretty good game. I actually enjoy playing it a lot. I think uh, I think they, they fixed a lot of issues that were annoying me a bit. Of course, the Pika's, Pika's advantage is, is a little bit better now. I think it was kind of instant, like wild, how you couldn't hold an angle and someone just flies past your screen and one taps you and you're like, motherfucker still running, you know, <laughs> like sure. you didn't even stop. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I enjoy the I enjoy the game a lot. I enjoy playing it. I enjoy practicing in it. I enjoy like all the new things that you can, that you can do. There's so many different options of building strats, building games, uh, like uh, rounds and, and doing map control is also different now. So it's like a, it's, I think it's good that it's refreshing for me as well because CS:GO was like oh, we played this for so long and now CS2 come in. Like I, I think it's I only think it's a great game. Of course they will keep updating it and I mean let's hope that they fix all the problems there is. But let's be real, it's also Valve, right? It will take its time, so we have to be patient as 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 players as well. But I enjoy it a lot. I think it's a it's a bang of a of a game. Right. One thing that is actually a positive compared to some of the past years in your career is back in the day, the option was you either have to get into one of the Danish teams. It has to be a or so heroic or there was at the time, the joke is there used to be about three international teams. Now, if you ever see those lists, on, they almost may as well get rid of the flags. It's just the EU flag on every team. Like now there's a million teams, even NA teams bring European, like there's a million teams just speak English basically. You're playing them, right? If people want to contact you, you are open to all offers. They can presumably, look, you bench, so I'm assuming they maybe have to negotiate with Nip, but you they can contact you, contact your agent, contact Nip, right? I am. Uh, I'm available to talks. I will talk with anyone. I'm uh, not going to turn anyone down. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm all up. But of course, you have to talk to Nip. Of course, like they still have to have a contract with me and and uh, those sort of things. So all the that stuff got to be fixed first. But um, yeah, I'm. I'm down to talk to anyone. I'm. I'm available 24/7. Uh, give me a text or talk to my agent, or my agent will talk to you. Or we'll f- figure something out. But I'm uh, definitely still motivated to uh, to to show a different config than the NIP config because that was absolutely sad. And we are here to fucking make it happen. In-game stuff aside, you do seem like you're in much better spirits than some of the past years and some of the hard times. Do you think actually, like, I mean, people have seen there hasn't been any big drama involved. In you. The joke is, like, aside from the Alexi B playbook thing, it's about the closer you've come to even have a little spike of drama. Has, it, has the actual, like, real-life aspect sort of resolved itself? It seems like you're in a better place, right? I've worked on myself in so many different ways, um, talk with so many different people, uh, sports psychologists, uh, uh, Trolls Robin from NIP uh, has helped me a lot as well. I've reflected a lot of things with him uh, during my time in NIP, and just like support from from friends and family and and those kind of things. Like it's it's been it's been a hell of a ride, but I've definitely developed into a better person, a better player, and a better teammate. I, I would I would say so. I, I feel. I mean, it's it's even it's unreal. Like I feel so much better. It, uh, even though this NIP stuff bench is fucking sad, sure. I still see the 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 light. You know, I still see like, oh my god, it maybe it's a blessing in disguise. You know, maybe I will come to another team and absolute dominate everyone, and I, that's that's what I want to get back to. At the end of the interview, do you have a final message? Do you want to thank anyone or say hello to anyone? I want to say thank you, to Thorin. I think uh, it's always nice you when you invite me into to talks like these, and and when interviewers are like offering someone that is in a period of time where it's a little bit sad to explain themselves or to to just enjoy having a good discussion uh, about things. I I really appreciate you giving me the time on, on your talk show. Yeah, manga tak. <laughs> manga tak. <laughs> Events come and go, fame rises and then falls away. You have a job, you lose a job. You do one thing, 
you have to move on to another. But one of the cool things about my career is I have my own support network who's always got my back. So I always know I can rely on the support to do the work I want to do and talk the way I want to talk and not have to follow certain rules that others arbitrarily have to follow. And that support group is, of course, called the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community. This video and all the others on my channel was kindly supported by Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Frisky, Ahmed Haju, Tobias Bernasconi, Toucan, Tosh, Jensen Gore, Animosity, and you know it, always my main man, Jerky's Minion, rocking with me, ride or die. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for a future episode of Reflections or a talk show? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are. Maybe you want to ask me a question for my video AMA where I tend to go quite in depth, or perhaps you want to take part in one of those really long donated discussions where we talk about whatever you're into in esports. Well, if any of those perks or any of the others catch your fancy, join the Skluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box where down below.